It's an election year, which you may have heard. Uh, Hillary Clinton is running for president, you may be aware. Uh, a guy named Donald Trump is running as well. And a gentleman from Vermont named Bernie Sanders is in the field. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen because we don't know whether Hillary is perhaps going to be indicted, which is certainly possible. Uh, if so, will someone like Joe Biden or Michael Bloomberg get into the race? If not, um, can a Bernie Sanders, an, an avowed and open socialist, win the presidency in the U.S.? Certainly possible. Uh, could Donald Trump be president? Can he translate some of his uh, media savvy and popularity into actual primary votes? Uh, could we end up with a Rubio or a Cruz? We just don't know. So I will make a couple of predictions, though, because we're trying to make predictions today. That's why we're here. I will make at least two very safe predictions, one of which is that commentators and pundits will say it's the most important election in our lifetimes. <laughs> and it infuriates me when I hear that, you know, this sort of drama. And the other thing is they'll say we're at a crossroads. America's ever and always at a crossroads. You know what I mean? We're always about to choose between two fundamentally different paths, when in fact the policies of the various candidates always seem about the same. So the policies seem the same, but the personalities seem quite different. And I, if I could speak to any of the candidates, I would offer just two easy pieces of advice that would really capture the sort of populist spirit we're having this year in, in 2016. I would just say any candidate who vows to, number one, not bomb any Islamic countries during their presidency, and number two, not put any U.S. troops on the ground in any Muslim countries during their presidency. If they just promised those two things, I guarantee you they would have a popular groundswell of voters behind them. They wouldn't even have to do so on moral grounds. They could do this simply on populist grounds. Because the neoconservative foreign policy that we've all been sold, and we'll talk about that today, is not nearly as popular as our elites would believe. But, of course, this idea of elites being out of touch with the electorate, right, this is nothing new. I'm sure some of the people in this room are old enough to remember the 1972 election when Richard Nixon won re-election in a landslide. He won 49 states. Now, the one state he didn't prevail in is Lou Rockwell's home state of Massachusetts. I don't know if any of us know what Lou was doing that year. Perhaps he was working for George McGovern in peace. But So he won, he won Massachusetts and he won the District of Columbia. And you've probably heard the story. There was a very famous uh, film critic named Pauline Kael who wrote for the, New, the uh, New Yorker and the New Republic. Quite a prestigious critic. And she was actually misquoted as saying, I can't believe Nixon won. I don't know anyone who voted for him. So it made it sound like she was just this completely out of touch, rich, snobby, elite in New York. Well, it turns out she said it sort of self-deprecatingly. She said, I live in a very isolated world, and in my world, no one I know voted for Richard Nixon. So she was actually acknowledging that the circles she ran in in New York were not the same as, let's say, you know, the Dakotas. Uh, but nonetheless, this stuck with her over the years. She's no longer with us. And, and this has become sort of a social mythology that... that there were so many people who were out of touch in places like New York City that they couldn't understand somebody like Nixon. And we saw this sentiment expressed again in 1980. Joan Walsh, who's now a, a columnist for Salon.com, was, was writing for a radical Santa Barbara, California newspaper at the time. And she said, you know, all, my friends and I, the night before the election, we we're all sure that, that there's no way this country could elect someone like Reagan. It's, it's just inconceivable. And of course, Reagan won in a landslide in 1980 against Jimmy Carter. So it's interesting how this, keeps, this cycle of out-of-touch elite seems to repeat itself. And if you fast forward a bit, some of you might recall in 2003, California held a recall election for their governor, Gray Davis. And this is a very contentious election. Um, it was two pieces. One was recalling Davis. The second was whether or not you were going to vote for Schwarzenegger. So all of the counties in San Francisco and Los Angeles voted against this recall. But yet, the recall passed by 55%, because California has lots of rural people inland. But we don't think of California that way. And Los Angelinos and San Franciscans certainly don't think of California that way. And I remember reading a letter to the editor at the time, and it said something like, you know, I can't believe now that we're going to have to be governed by a man we despise, who, whose views we abhor, just because he got, you know, these yokels out in the country to vote for him. You know, why should we be governed by him? Well, why indeed? 
It's a pretty good question if you think about it. And from my perspective, I'm not sure any philosopher or political theorist or certainly uh, um, social contract theorist has ever answered that question to our satisfaction. Why should we be governed by someone we don't want to be governed by? So do we really think that if Trump wins that progressives will accept this? Do we really think if, if Hillary Clinton wins that the right wing will just accept this, that they'll just accept Ted Cruz? And I'm not just talking about they won't accept it in the sense, you know, well, there was voter fraud somehow like in the 1980 election or in the sense that, well, there's too much PAC money and Citizens United lets all this money come in and it alters the election. I'm talking about something more fundamental, that, that we're reaching a point in America where people are starting to view the democratic will of the country as invalid. So that's really a profound change if, if you think about it. I mean, we may well be reaching the end of this myth of democratic consensus. And from my perspective, that's a great thing. That's a healthy thing. And, you know, these divisions have always existed. We talk about red state, blue state, right versus left. I, I, look at colonial period. You had the Jeffersonians, the Hamiltonians. Look at the Civil War. Look at the New Deal. I mean, we've had deep divisions in our country throughout our history. But I think what's changed fundamentally is that we now have two things. We have a much more diverse population, culturally, religiously, ethnically, etc., in large part due to the 1965 Civil Rights Act, excuse me, 1965 Immigration Act. And number two, we now have this thing called the Internet. And with the Internet comes these things called social media. And what's especially important is that the Internet provides anonymity, or at least relative anonymity. So for the first time really in our history, we had this incredibly detailed sense of what other people really think. And you can go on to Washington Post or New York Times and just see these really acid comments. So I think this is actually quite new in America, and it's starting to expose the great elite lie of democracy, which is democracy is only valid when the right guy wins, right? So this mythology of democratic consensus finds its home in what we might call the mythical consensus. We might call it the Bush-Clinton axis, right? This is the kind of center, the moderates, you know, your David Brooks, your Chuck Todd's on Meet the Press, your Jennifer Rubens, your George Will. So they've convinced us that there's a consensus in America. And these are just some of the elements of this mythical consensus. I'm sorry at those screens, they seem far away. But what they've convinced us is that if we could just do away with, it, with these extremists and these ideologues and bring the conversation back to the center, there's really this great consensus down the middle of the country, and this is really where serious people ought to be governing. And you can always tell a consensus type when they use the slur called the adults in the room. Have you ever heard this? Well, we need the adults in the room. Apparently, that doesn't include us. So, so one of the hallmarks of this mythical consensus, of course, is globalism and democracy, the benefits of both these things. They don't see the inherent conflict between those two, of course. Globalism and democracy globalism tends to attenuate direct democracy. But they don't see the irony, and they say these things are all ever and always good, and we all believe in the UN and the EU project and the IMF and things like the International Criminal Court. These are just part of the consensus. We all agree that these are good. We all agree with neoconservative foreign policy. This is taken as an article of faith that it's America's duty to spread democracy, and we understand this which really means intervene militarily, but also intervene using foreign aid and non-government organizations. And we all accept the neoconservative foreign policy as a settled part of the American consensus. We all accept central banking. The role of the Fed and other central banks in creating money goes unquestioned. It's inconceivable that we would operate in this country without a central bank, so says the consensus. We all agree to this sort of post-constitutional legal landscape, right? where we simply accept judicial review as it allows the Supreme Court to make law. We accept executive orders as a form of go executive governance, the corporation doctrine. We accept that the Commerce Clause and the General Welfare Clause have basically vitiated Article 1, Section 8 powers. Uh, we all agree that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are effectively null and void, that these things are decided consensus. We all believe in a robust public education system. We can't really Amer imagine America without it. We all believe in a robust entitlement system, Social Security and Medicare being the hallmarks of those. 
And here, I hate to say, is a place where the, uh, the consensus types might actually be right. When you look at some of the data, there is an, an awful lot of support for Social Security and Medicare. So you have to hand it to the progressives for creating uh, the, these programs that created a middle class um, entitlement electorate. We all agree at some level of reasonable taxation and regulation. You know, we don't call it socialism if you just sort of regulate industries. This is, this is just something we all know is, is for the best. We all agree that abortion's okay. Um, it would be radical to get rid of it. There might be some restrictions we would place on abortion, but late-term abortions, that sort of thing. But for the most part, abortion is not going to go away. That's the consensus. And we all agree to this sort of myriad nebulous benefits of pluralism and diversity and affirmative action and uh, gay marriage, gay civil rights. Uh, these things are sort of unquestioned as part of the new American consensus, according to the David Brooks and the Jennifer Rubens and the George Wills. And finally, the, the American consensus down the middle believes in, in reasonably open immigration. You know, it would be nice if we could stop these, these MS-13 tattooed gang members from El Salvador coming. That would be nice. But for the most part, you know, it, the, the immigration is noble and, and we should permit it. So this is the consensus that we're told holds in America. But if you spend a lot of time online, and you, just in the Washington Post and the New York Times, much less the fever swamps of some of the sites like Salon or some of the sites, of, some of the social media surrounding Black Lives Matters, Occupy Wall Street, feministing.com, you'll see that, that there's actually not so much of a consensus on these items. You'll actually see that there's some different things that the emerging, the resurging socialist left really believe. Now, the socialist left is sort of embodied by the Bernie Sanders phenomenon, but there's not necessarily direct overlap. Some, some people on what I would call the socialist left love Bernie. Some think perhaps he's not radical enough. But if you look online and read what socialist progressives really think, you'll find that they go way beyond globalism. They're, they're, they're pure internationalists. They truly believe in, in some sort of global governance above and beyond Washington, D.C. and Brussels. Um, their, their number one hallmark, I would say, identifier is identity politics, so, social justice. Every issue of the day has to be viewed for this, through this filter of sexism and racism and homophobia and privilege. And that the conclusion we draw from this is that America's past is, is largely shameful, and hence we have to progress. That's why, we called, well, that's why we're called progressives. So identity politics are really at the heart of Bernie Sanders' new socialist left. On foreign policy, it's a bit muddled. I would, call, I would say that the left has sort of a Peace Corps foreign policy. They're not necessarily completely on board with neoconservatives in, in terms of bombing and boots on the ground, but they're, they're awfully flexible when a Democrat becomes president. When Obama was elected, we, find, we, we suddenly find that Code Pink is not so active and that what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria is perhaps not so awful. But there's maybe some, some daylight at the end of the tunnel that the left is a little, more, little less bellicose in this sense. Um, central banking, the Sanders left tends to be a little confused. They tend to have some suspicion of the Fed and some understanding that it might benefit elites, but they're not sure they want to do away with it, and they don't like the idea of gold. Uh, Bernie Sanders has actually hired a modern monetary theorist, if you want to look that up, MMT, which is a whole new sort of uh, monetary policy. Um, he's hired a, a, a woman who's a professor uh, to be part of his campaign team. On economics, of course, the Sanders left is, is absolutely socialist. Uh, they advocate either de facto, if not outright, nationalization of whole industries like banking, energy, education, health care. They, of course, advocate for vastly increased welfare and entitlements. Uh, they think that America has a very thin social safety net, if at all, and they would see us have a, a system much more European in outlook. And of course, of course, they're for wage and price controls. And I include in this the idea of a minimum wage because that is a, that is a, a wage floor of sorts. Uh, as a matter of fact, they take the, the minimum wage very, very seriously. 
Uh, you'll see this in some cities like Seattle and others where they've now instituted a $15 minimum wage. They believe in guaranteed income scenarios. They believe that everyone ought to have some form of income solely for existing in America. They also believe in income limits. If you get into places like Salon and Democratic Underground, you'll see that there's plenty of people in Bernie's camp who actually be, believe that income should be capped at a certain level, whatever that might be. Of course, uh, climate change and global warming are very important to the socialist left. They believe in banning fossil fuels ultimately. They certainly believe in banning private fire, firearms ownership. This is something that you will absolutely find uh, almost uniformly on the left, that firearms have no business being owned privately by individuals, certainly not more uh, military-style firearms. They also believe in, in free speech with an asterisk next to it, right? They believe in criminalizing certain types of hate speech that make people feel bad about themselves. Something more than just yelling fire in a crowded theater, but actually just something where, where someone feels abused or impugned upon uh, via social media, for instance. And finally, I think maybe one of the most interesting elements of socialist progressives today that they actually share with some people on the right is they're not seeking consensus. It's no longer about this consensus America where we're trying to win you over ideologically or get your vote. The socialist left is actually quite comfortable with working through executive orders, with working through the judiciary. Um, with making decisions simply based on demographic changes. In other words, if, if certain demographics don't agree with us, um, changes will come via immigration or, or just through birth and death rates. So there seems to be less of this idea that we have to, we have to win over the center. There's kind of a, an edge to what you'll read uh, online from some of these people. And I, I find it very interesting. And frankly, I, I find it somewhat refreshing because I like the idea that the Sanders left is using the term socialist. And I like the idea that they're talking about these things openly because I think it's healthy if we do so. And I think we who are on the other side of socialism ought to be just as, as brave and use just as much candor. But there's a new element in, a, in the American electorate this year called the alt-right. Now the alt-right is a really interesting mix of people. It's not so much an ideology or a political movement as you might almost call it a zeitgeist. Right? They, they don't particularly have a home like National Review for conservatives or, or Salon for liberals, but they exist pr primarily on social media. They're anti-establishment, they're anti-GOP, and they're a certainly anti-mainstream media. And what's interesting about this, the alt-right, this emergent alt-right, is that they, they actually tend to be quite a bit younger than traditional conservatives whose, whose ages are higher. So if you look at at some places like Breitbart, where you can get a, a bit of a flavor for the alt-right, and especially in the Twitterverse, uh, you'll find a whole new species of what we might call right-wingers who are much younger and see the world in a much different way. Probably more than anything, the alt-right is populist in orientation. They, they dislike elites, they're distrustful of elites, but they're not necessarily ideological. And that's actually one of their beefs with libertarians. They say that America isn't working and it's not so much an ideological problem as it is a populist problem. And because they're populist, as you might expect, they're also openly nationalist. They believe in the idea of an America, uh, you know, how much that involves the government really depends. But this idea of a uniquely American identity is okay with the alt-right. And they also believe that America's past is not necessarily shameful, that we've gone too far and sort of denigrating ourselves and beating ourselves up. And of course, the alt-right is defined by its position on immigration. And when it comes to immigration, the alt-right is for limited or no immigration whatsoever. And this is really going to be a sticking point for Trump and I think any candidate who wants to win their votes. What's interesting about the alt-right is, is while they, we think of the neoconservative right or the establishment right or the fundamentalist right in America is being deeply religious and coming from religious convictions, the alt-right is more culturally Christian. In other words, they, they like Christian culture because of what it produced in the West ideologically. They like America for what she's produced. But they're not this kind of, of Christians you'll find necessarily in fundamentalist Baptist circles. Uh, they're not turn-the-other-cheek Christians. And they, they, they view Christianity, at least in its current forms in America, as somewhat weak.
weak-willed and not standing up to some of these ideological and cultural forces that the alt-right would say are destroying us. On the foreign policy side, they kind of believe in an America first foreign policy. So here's where perhaps the alt-right gets closest to libertarian perspective. The idea that we shouldn't expend blood or treasure in trying to fix the Middle East or save the Middle East. So while the, the alt-right is suspicious of Islam and, and interested in, in shutting down or limiting immigration, they're not necessarily interested in expanding our wars or our footprints in the Middle East. They're equally suspicious of central banking. They may not be anti-Fed in the technical sense. They may not have thought through all the machinations of money creation and inflation, but they do understand how the Fed creates an, a, an elite in this country, and really an illegitimate elite. So in that sense, they're, they're anti-Fed because they're anti-elite. And they're certainly not free market ideologues, even though they are on the right, which is normally in our popular parlance associated more with free markets. In other words, the alt-right sees things that are more important than just economics. They say there's, there's other things beyond economics that trump those interests. And so we ought, to look at, we ought to look at things like protectionism from an America first perspective. And so you can see sort of a thread maybe from the early 90s and Pat Buchanan this, that, that finds its way all the way up to the alt-right today. Now on, on issues of race and diversity and social justice, of course, the alt-right is deeply skeptical. They say, you know, all these things that we've been told are necessarily good are not necessarily so good for us. And we're going to question these things. We're going to question feminism we're going to question multiculturalism. We're going to question affirmative action, diversity, et cetera, et cetera. And so, of course, as a result of this, the alt-right has been tarred as racist and xenophobic. That may be true, but it may also be true that a more charitable view of the alt-right would see them as simply saying, hey, look, identity politics is a two-way street. We've been beaten over the head for all these years, and now we're going to reassert ourselves. Now, the alt-right certainly differs from the, the Sanders left on the question of guns. They say guns are A-OK. -okay. As a matter of fact, guns are good and guns belong in private hands. And finally, on this last point, what the alt-right really shares with the progressive left, with the socialist left, is this idea that they're not seeking consensus. This is no longer a meeting of the minds or a meeting in the middle. This is now sort of open warfare, at least online. And the alt-right feel so marginalized, they feel like the American dream is so far in the rearview mirror now, that they're not even really arguing with progressives. They're not even really talking to progressives. Uh, the internet and the anonymity it creates has allowed us to have these sort of atomized areas where we go and we read and we talk to people who think a lot like us. So it's interesting that the alt-right, while it blasts progressives and while it makes fun of progressives and it doesn't really seek to change their minds. And I think that's part of this awakening that's happening in America. So what can we learn from all this? As libertarians, what can we learn from the alt-right and the progressive left? Because it seems like all the action this year is populism. And libertarians never really been populist in its orientation. And I know some people in this room are probably discouraged. We've, we've read articles that say, well, you know, the libertarian moment is past. This has been a theme in, in Fox News and BBC, in The Week, in Politico, in Washington Post. You know, all these events have occurred. We've had, uh, you know, the bombings in Paris. We've had these refugee crises across Germany and other countries in Europe. Well, uh, we've had all, all the turmoil and problems in Syria happening. You know, and perhaps Rand Paul didn't quite catch fire in the way that the mainstream media thought he might a year ago. And you put all this into a blender and, and the media likes to tell us that the libertarian moment is past. But I disagree with that. I, I suggest we look at the populist uprising as an opportunity, not as something that should disillusion us. Now, we've all probably heard some version of the saying that just because you don't take an interest in politics, politics takes an interest in you right, whether we like it or not. And this, this is attributed to the Athenian, to Pericles, supposed to have said this in about 430 BC. And Pericles is actually talked about as an early statesman and an early populist. So, so he really liked the idea of using populism as statecraft, as a form of statecraft. 
Now, as libertarians, we don't believe in statecraft. But does that mean we, we also must not believe in populism? Well, Rufus, J. Rufus Fears was a famous historian. He's no longer with us, but he was a, an historian for many, many years at Oklahoma University. And he really studied Pericles, among other statesmen. And he defined a statesman as someone with vision, but also the ability to achieve consensus to achieve that vision. And that's the rub, right? Achieving consensus to achieve the vision. Because today in America, there's no longer a vision and there's no longer a consensus. Therefore, there are no statesmen. As a matter of fact, I used to cringe when I heard people call Ron Paul a statesman. Because I thought, here's this great man who should be known as a doctor and an educator, not as, so, not as someone who would ever, ever want to use statecraft or have a vision for your life. But I understood it. I understood why people meant it as a compliment. But today we're at a point where the sheer failure of politics, this grinding divisiveness that these elections are putting upon us every four years, is creating this growing awareness of the futility of it all the failure to achieve any consensus versus what we see as the real consensus, the real harmony all around us in the marketplace every day surrounding us. Now, there's a lot of ways we might define a libertarian society or more libertarian society, but one way we might define it is to say a libertarian society is a society where the great matters of the day, cultural, economic, social, are not decided by politics. And I would suggest that we are heading in exactly that direction. Now, we shouldn't be naive as the state loses control, loses support, loses consensus. It could go either way. The marketplace and civil society could expand, but the state could also expand in some very nasty fashions. But I'm convinced that this loss of faith in government is, is quantifiably different today. This is not just our grandparents sort of complaining about, let's throw all the bums out. This is different. Something's different in America today. And really, that's what our movement is all about, right? It's helping people make the leap from where they already are, which is government isn't working, to where they need to be, which is government can't work. At least certainly not a government of 320 million diverse people, top-down style from Washington, D.C. It's an absurdity. And we just need to help people understand that. You know, the socialist left opposes an economic elite. The alt-right opposes a cultural elite. Both of these elites, to a large extent, find currency are created and funded by the state. So we should take the opportunity to make that point and channel some of this anger into our movement. Now, sometimes I've heard and I've read that, well, just being anti-establishment or opposing things is not enough. Well, okay. Eh, maybe it's not enough, but it's a good start. It's an excellent start. And probably a lot of people in this room started that way. So let's embrace populist. Let's embrace populism. Political parties might be coming to an end. We might have to face the possibility that the future is less ideological because populists, by definition, are less ideological. And there's nothing wrong with issue libertarianism, single issue libertarianism. Ron Paul worked this very, very well with regard to end the Fed, which was a populist uprising, and with regard to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. These were both populist sentiments that didn't need a lot of intellectualization to sell. And libertarianism is not an intellectual exercise, right? It's not a suicide pact. It has to offer real solutions to the problems people see. The state isn't working. The Fed can't work. Neoconservative foreign policy can't work. Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid can't work. On paper or otherwise. So we know what can. We know what real money is. We know what real economic prosperity is. We know what real peace is. And finally, despite claims to the contrary, as believers in the marketplace, we know what real social cohesion looks like. It's not the state. So we can't afford to look down our noses at this sort of populist uprising. Remember, it's not just elections that are won and lost on these tribal and emotionalist grounds. It's not just elections that are won on self-interest. It's whole movements 
that are won on naked self-interest. And too often libertarianism is viewed as people who have heads without bodies, right? Without guts, without stomachs. Or worst case scenario, as C.S. Lewis called them, men without chests. So libertarianism doesn't mean to mean this hyper-individualized, atomized society where all we care about is pure economics. Society without the state doesn't mean society without culture or language or identity or God or something bigger than ourselves. So I'll conclude with this. The future is not necessarily left versus right, red state versus blue state, status versus libertarian. The future is centralized versus decentralized. It's what works versus what doesn't. It's reasonable people versus unreasonable people. It's PC versus the truth. So libertarians shouldn't be heartless any more than they should be headless. And I will conclude by just saying that who we are as people is equally as important as what we think as libertarians. So thank you very much.